So I, I was misbilled as talking about yeah, beautiful, uh, my work, which is in atmospheric chemistry at the university. I'll glance on it, but uh, I, I was asked about my hobby. I have given this talk a few times previously, or at least a similar one. So um, if you're interested in, in the science sort of side of things and the atmospheric chemistry, I do work in greenhouse gas measurement. Oh, I'm happy to chat afterwards, but I have to be actually really careful as a person that works in greenhouse research. Um, I'm a technical person, I'm not actually a scientist, so I don't do the data interpretation. I make the machines that they get the measurements that they then interpret with. So I could make a mistake. Uh, it's not my expertise. And if I made some great claim about something or another and uh, and it was actually wrong and it went up on YouTube and someone picked up on it, as a member of the university, working at the university, I could get in trouble. <laughs> um, it's unfortunately a very political topic and there has been some rumour that some people may not have come because I was supposed to be talking about it. I don't know if that's true or not. But people have very strong opinions about it. I'll, I'll go on the record of saying that I agree with the 97% of scientists from what I've seen and all the measurements I've done, all the work that I put in to try and get our instruments to measure correctly and accurately, I'm convinced that, uh, that there's something going on and it's us that's causing it. But beyond that, one-on-one, uh, -on -one I might offer some more, but as a representative of the university, I'll stay politically silent. <laughs> so, on to a less controversial topic, astrophotography. Started off, I worked for 20 years as a mach fit of machinist. I got into computer program machining and uh, found that stuff very interesting, but for one reason or another, it wasn't working for me. And I ended up fluking a job at university. I've been there for just over 16 years now. I've been playing trumpet since I was eight, and actually was just talking to Alan Soden, who I played uh, Handel's Messiah and uh, uh, the Armed Man, Carl Jenkins, with with the uh, Lydian singers. I've played with them a number of times, and I play in a big band, um, seventeen-piece swing band, which is great fun. Um, I was just around the back adjusting the microphone. I found that amplifier because of the feedback that was going on before. I kind of get sucked in. I feel the electrons and I search out the room with the buttons. <laughs> and I uh, I couldn't stand the feedback, so I found it and I think I fixed it. <laughs> I, I, I've never thought of myself as a collector. I, I've never thought, you know, I wasn't the one collecting the Teenage Mutant Ninja Tur uh, Turtles cards or anything like that. Mum probably back that up. I've never been a collector. But I look back and I think I have been a collector. I collect hobbies. And so as I sort of rumble through life, I, oh, there's another interesting one. So I did six years, one subject a semester as a hobby doing philosophy um, because I had some questions I wanted to answer. And uh, I like to build stuff. I've just given my son my 1969 Falcon that I've been driving for the last 20 years. And I saw it yesterday and still feel sad. But I now have Dad's 1936 Buick that he's given to me, which I've known since I was about 10. So I tinker, I've got a lathe and a milling machine in the back, I've got a welder, and so there's, it's a lot of fun to just go out there and build stuff. And um, so uh, also I got into, through my music, I got into sound and I enjoy sound engineering. I've got a stereo that I kind of put together over 20 years and drove to Melbourne because I got a hum once and that sort of thing. I, I don't go into things lightly. When I, when I get into something, they become an obsession as much as a hobby. So I've just got this accumulation of interests and things that I've played with, you know, wiring things up and so forth. And when I was about 20, 21, I shared a house with a couple of photographers, uh, professional photographers, uh, one with the Navy and one had his own business, actually here and now. And I looked at those things and I thought, oh man, they'd be fun. But I saw how much gear they had, bags full of lenses, and they had, you know, back then you're on film, so they had their um, uh, dark rooms and, and they're doing the push. And I thought, I cannot afford to even look at a camera at this stage in my life. It's just too dangerous. They look too fun. But uh, fast forward, my wife did all of the birthday and Christmas photos and family photos and so forth. 
and I judiciously ignored the cameras until a camera that we had for quite some time died and digitals were around. And I thought, oh, actually, you don't have to have a dark room for them. You don't have to keep putting film in and you can get it wrong a dozen times and delete them. So I thought this could be a bit interesting. So I talked her into letting me have a camera with a couple of extra settings, just a small one, but you could go in and set the aperture and anything. And uh, that's when I started taking, you know, silly photos of a computer screw to see if I could get the thread beautifully defined. And oh, now I need a, now I need a um, tripod, and and now I need a this, and now I need a that. <clears throat> and I got sick of that camera. And tragically, my daughter put it onto the tripod incorrectly to take a photo, and it fell off, and it broke the lens. And oh no, I had to buy a better camera. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was devastated <laughs> and I fiddled with that one and I can tell you the moment I fell out of love with that camera, I was on a beach up in Mackay, I was up there with work and I was on a beach trying to take a photo of a sand crab next to a little ball of sand on sand and this thing wasn't an, uh, an SLR and you've got this core sort of push this button this way, that way, take a photo and hooks out of photos, take a photo and hooks out of photos. Ah! And I stood there for, I don't know, 15 minutes and I didn't get a shot that was in focus. So my wife is a wonderful person and uh, she could see that I was looking at the digital SLRs every time I walked into a shop with cameras. And one day, I found out afterwards that she, she has, it's cheaper than um, getting counselling or psychiatrist. <laughs> She's worked out that when I'm particularly stressed at work and and really starting to wind up, which I get, and I really do make things visible for people at home as well as myself. If she lets me buy a new toy, I then play with that toy incessantly for as long as it takes me to read every page of the manual and work every setting out. And it actually makes me a little bit easier to live with for a while. <laughs> so she said to me one day, and obviously I was particularly unpleasant, why don't you buy it? And I thought, oh, oh, that's, yeah, okay, I could possibly, possibly do that. And uh, it was on special. You have to do these things when they're on special. So I bought a digital SLR. But the thing was, even like I predicted when I was 20, I can't stop. And so where was it going to end up? I, I didn't know, but I, you know, I, I was on this journey now. Oh, sorry, this is a, <laughs> an extra bit I added in. Um, I'll, in I'll interlude. So I've mentioned uh, that since I'm working in this research, people might be slightly interested in having a quick look at what I do. So in the top left-hand corner, there's a picture of uh, the second latest generation of the instrument that I have helped to build up and get running over the last 20 years. <coughs> it, that particular box is an air-conditioned box sitting in a paddock in, on a research farm up near Camden and it's measuring with chambers. So there are boxes with lids that can be pneumatically operated, they're all automated. And so there's 12 chambers on each of two of these instruments, 24 of them, and they're dug into the ground. And uh, the ground has been treated in different ways. And so if it, you circulate the air through that box and the lids are open, you get the air that's just out in the atmosphere. But if you close the lid, then if anything is being used up by bugs, it drops. If anything is being emitted, it grows. So you run it, and you run around, so we do half an hour on each chamber, and you get this growth. And from that, you can work out the rate that the uh, various gases are being emitted. And we measure in that instrument uh, carbon dioxide, and we can get, for those that know what isotopes are, we can get multiple isotopes of those. Um, we can get carbon monoxide, methane, nitrous oxide um, are the gases that we, we measure on that one instrument. So the second photo across shows the sort of fun I get. If you look closely, you'll see that I went to the commercial um, kitchen suppliers and bought the stainless steel funnel that's inverted on the top. And then the stainless steel salad bowl that's underneath. And then I designed and had built the mounting setup there's actually a black tube you can't really see at the bottom. And that is up the mast of a research ship, the uh, Southern Surveyor, which has been sold now 
they've got a new um, RV investigator that's just come on. So that's me fitting this funnel right up the top of the mast on the Southern Surveyor. And that's so the waves can break over the top and you can see a black line coming out the top. That's where we suck our air. We don't really want any water. So the water has to, to get to it, the water would have to do a pretty good job and the water can drain out through the bottom. And next to that is the instrument, one of our earlier instruments, along with another analyzer sitting next to it. And that's down in what they call the fish lab, which is actually where they used to fill the fish on this trawler, which has been converted. Um, the next one on the bottom left is all the, those three instruments. Like those three instruments are all different versions of the same instrument. That actually was sat in the Manildra farm, just around the corner of Hawaiian Corn and Gatta Mountain, again with chambers, and we were treating nitrous oxide and getting measurement on pasture. So we're looking at how to better manage what fertiliser you put on, what form do you put the fertiliser. You know, so we, we get we can farm and get better productivity with less emissions. But also we were testing a new technique of measuring the air uh, with the PH or actually long student at the time. And uh, that instrument was the one that we could believe because we tested a lot and we're using it to verify another technique and also using it as part of that technique. The next one over is a container that's owned by NASA. That's up in Darwin. It's been moved from that site now, but you can see there's an astronomical dome on the top. And there's, uh, there's a, a sun tracker in there that actually follows the sun, puts a beam of light down. The sunlight has come down through the atmosphere, from the top of the atmosphere, right down to the ground onto our mirror. And different gases absorb different regions of the infrared spectrum as it comes down through the atmosphere. And it also is affected by the pressure, air pressure. So we measure the pressure on the ground, we get layers right to the top, and we can actually get a profile of carbon dioxide, is the primary one we're looking at here, from the ground to the top of the atmosphere. And this is used, we have satellites fly over and they measure these stations. There's about 25 around the world. They're called TCON, Total Carbon Column Observing Network. Uh, these TCON stations are the gold standard of carbon dioxide measurement. They're about a million dollars a throw. That one's owned by NASA, but they contract us to look after it. And we've got one in the Wollongong University that uh, we look after. And we've just, uh, one, of our, one of our colleagues has just installed one in the Philippines. So this is used to validate the measurements made by the satellites. And this was uh, the first two. Um, this is a telescope mounted on a plate with a spectrometer on the side. And this is at a phosphate rock mine out near about 150 kilometers southwest of Mount Isa. And it was fly in, fly out mine. And they had problems with um, people being exposed to fluoride, silicon tetrafluoride, hydrogen fluoride. So um, there was health concerns and they had two instruments measuring it. They had little monitors like this you can see on your belt and they had a large one in this large production plant where they actually made fertiliser. And you'd have the one on your belt beeping like this massive alarm and saying it's well exceeding the safe limits. But the one that was in the plant was saying everything's fine. So they actually contracted us to make measurements. So in this case, the beam of infrared light comes out of that instrument into the telescope, points at an array of mirrors 80, 100 metres away, and then the light bounces back and we can measure what's absorbing in there. And we were the arbiter of whether or not people were being exposed to unsafe levels of this fluoride gas. And it's got terrible, terrible um, consequences. It rots your teeth. And, but talking about difficult polit political, you're on a small mine where everyone knows everyone and you're the weirdo from the uni. And I had a pregnant lady come up to me and say, are they killing my baby? And we said, I don't know. I'm not a medic person. We just take our measurements. We'll, we'll be honest with the results we get and other people can decide whether it's safe or not. Funnily enough, our measurements agreed with the larger instrument saying everything was okay, and we speculate that there were little bubbles of the gas kind of emerging and bubbling across, and one of those bubbles would go through your instrument and it would trigger, but when you measured over 100 metre average, we didn't have a problem. So we had little pockets of concentrated high levels. 
And that's, uh, I'm just standing in a cane field up in, that's in Mooloomaba, where again we did chamber measurements, looking at the best way to fertilise uh, and treat, uh, like work with the soil. They had acid sulphate soils there. And so it's a way of helping the farmers get as much out of their uh, farm as they can with the minimum impact on the environment. And it's a win-win, actually. People often think that we would be at odds with the farmer, but in this case, it was putting fertiliser on that causes nitrous oxide to come off, and it's a greenhouse gas. Now, if we can tell them exactly what fertiliser to put on and the right time to put it on and exactly how much, they don't have to put on any more than they need to. The farmers used to say, I'll put on this plus insurance. And the insurance was fertiliser that they paid for and got nothing from it, no benefit. So if we could tell them, actually, we've done a lot of work and we had soil scientists and they you know we had a whole suite of people work on the problem. If we can tell them that if you, you do this, you can save yourself this much money and still get or the same or even do better because they're farming exactly you know, what they need. And so it's actually a win-win if it's done right. It doesn't have to be a win-lose. So... Back to the um, back to the main well main topic. So that's a, that's a photograph of the Triffid Nebula that was taken from my backyard in Warrawong in Wollongong, and um, it's an example of the sort of stuff that I'm able to do now. In the middle, that the red and the blue, that's the nebula. That's hydrogen gas glowing. The red stuff is glowing, and the blue stuff is hydrogen gas that's reflecting. And you see there's a sort of pattern through the middle of it, that's dust lanes. So that's dust just out in, um, in space. That's the stuff that everything's made of. Um, that's within our galaxy. I think that's about stardust. Yes, we are all stardust. Uh, I think that's about, I might be wrong, but I'm not gonna get into trouble if I only look it up, but I think that's about um, 16,000 light years away. Um, and uh, I'll go through it and talk about how to get that photo. You don't just pick up a camera and go click. There's a, there's a bit of work in it. So I have a theory that there's basically two kinds of photographers in this world. There's people that like the light, that love the memories, they love the photos, they like to look at them, or they love the sunsets, and they have to use a camera to get them. And often they will learn the barest minimum that they can to get a good enough result. So they like your fully automated cameras, they like them to be light, easy to transport, fit in bag, often the phone camera's perfectly good enough for that sort of photography. But I think there's another kind of photographer and that's people that like the camera and have to take photos. And I am one of those, it's like Dad was saying, oh, how does that work? What is it doing? And cameras are kind of cool. They're a fun bit of technology. There's all these lenses and sensors and things and electronics. So why not play with one? But if you're that type of photographer, you've got to find something to take photos of. And it could be, for me, a computer screw. Like I said, I literally took 70 photos one night of a computer screw. And that, that's fine by me, but uh, it's not so much fun when you want to show people, oh, look what I did. <laughs> um, and see that one there, see how that thread's just a little bit more defined than that one? That's when I used F6.2. You know? mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I pursue these things out of that interest. And one night I had my new-ish camera and I've got, I don't know, are there people here who know much about photography? Uh, I'm assuming we've got a mix, some people know a bit and some people don't know. Just if I start going blah, 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 it's F this or whatever, ignore it. I hope it'll be interesting anyway. But for those that have some idea of what I'm talking about, that's just a 300mm um, telephoto lens. So it's like a little, little telescope on the front of the camera. And I took that photo of the moon and at the time I was sufficiently pleased with it that I thought I'd put my name on it. And that was on the 30th of January 2010. And I thought, gee, I wonder if I can do any better than that. And that's a dangerous thing for me. <laughs> so I borrowed we, had, we used telescopes at work for some of our measurements, and there was a telescope basically the same as that, 
under the bench, it, it was bought, but it wasn't good enough to do what we needed, so it was just sitting there not being used. And I said, hey, can I borrow that telescope? And one of my colleagues has been into astronomy since he was a kid, and he's a little older than me, and he's got a PhD in physics, and he's a handy bloke to know. So he said, you know, if you buy a little adapter, you can put your camera on that. And, and I looked it up, and for $20, I could buy a little fitting. And so the descent in madness began. I clicked it on, and now I shot this photo. And you can see that there's a lot more detail in the image. Again, I was pleased with enough to put my name on it because um, it was all very exciting. And I, I started taking a lot of shots of the moon. And then I found Saturn, and I discovered that I can see now that there's a um, set of rings. And uh, thank you very much. I'm assuming it's. He might have just liked water, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so so I, I was very pleased that you can actually see the rings of Saturn there, and that was just shot from a back porch with that same small telescope. But as these things often are, nothing is as straightforward as you like, and my boss wanted part of the lens out of this telescope. We used it to um, align one of our spectrometers. And he had a rant at me about why don't why have you got that at home? I want it right now. I'd already got it, but it just turned out it was stupid and annoying. So then I better buy something just to get myself going. So I, I by this time I joined an astronomy club, and I said uh, I sent out an email saying, well, if anyone's got a something in their garage they're not using, something that's not too expensive that I can buy off you just to have a play until I figure out what I want and save up some money then that'd be fantastic. So I went along to the next meeting, and uh, one of the guys said, oh, look, I've got a telescope at home, and it's my spare, I'm not using it, just bottle it, you don't have to buy anything, or, you know, someone helped me out when I was starting, so how about, you? I just loaned it to you, and I thought, oh, yeah. So he loaned me that. And now we're starting to talk, this is getting fun, it's got a computer on it, it's got a GPS on it. You can, um, you can mount your camera on the back, and it's got about 30,000 objects that you can call up and it'll drive to it and track it. And so I'm out in the backyard with that, and this is all great and fun. But, uh, so, so yeah, here's a shot of the moon from that one. And you can see that we're starting to move in, so we're getting much more sort of interesting stuff going on. And there's a shot of Jupiter, and you can actually see a little bit of the atmosphere in there. So. Um, I'm now, yeah, the, the hook's in the mouth and I'm getting reeled in. <laughs> but nothing is simple. So there's a thing called field rotation. So I've, <coughs> pardon the jargon, but this is called an al azimuth or altitude azimuth mount. And all it means is that you can raise and lower the height of that blue tube to, to get your elevation. And the azimuth mount is just rotating this way. And so to follow a target with an alt azimuth mount, if the target's going up like that, you just follow it like that. And so, and your camera's just on the back, and it follows it like that. But, this is the sub, uh, for those that don't know, we've, we've got a south celestial pole and north celestial pole. And as the, as the Earth orbits, the sky rotates around those points. And so this is as from Wollongong, um, and that's about 9 o'clock at night. And you can see the Southern Cross on the uh, left-hand side, about two-thirds of the way up. And the centre of those lines is the point at which the sky rotates. It just goes round, round that. That is about an hour later, and that's another two hours later again. So you see it's rotating around that point. And the problem with that is that if you just point a telescope at it and you've got a camera on it, you start off and if that's the Southern Cross, it's, it's like this. And then 12 hours later, it's like that. And if you just follow it, it just does this inside your telescope. So all you get is a set of swirls and it's hopeless. So that's um, a star cluster, 
a mixed toy. And, uh, no, yes. And, and uh, there's about 20 million stars in that. But if you look and if you zoom in on it, all the stars have got this twist on it. Nothing's a pinpoint. It's all just going like this. So you, you're very limited to the amount of time you can open the camera without getting these lines. And that's all fine if you like those star trail things, but if you want to just get something, you, you can't have this. So being a fitter and turner, there was a guy in the club who was making up these things. He'd already cut out plates. I finished it. You see that aluminium plate? That's called an equatorial wedge. And with that, you mount the telescope so the back of it, which would normally be down like this, is like this, and you point it at that point in the sky that everything rotates around. And then as you turn, your camera turns with it, and then you can point that telescope anywhere and then just turn that one bottom axis at the sp speed that the globe rotates and it'll follow. So that's, that, that suddenly means you can put your camera on and you can expose for longer periods of time. So by this time, I borrowed that telescope for about three months and I started to feel real guilty. The guy wasn't asking me for it, but I th thought, uh, you know, I've, I've taken advantage as much as I should and, and it's time to commit some money. And about that time, I went to, well, at that time, I went to one of the astronomy meetings and one of the guys who'd been very friendly and helpful said to me, look, or said to the club, look, I want to sell my whole rig and start again. I'm going for a completely different setup. Is there someone who wants to buy out the lot? Now, I wasn't planning to go this way, but I then quickly rang my wife, and she being the long-suffering person she is, and knowing me as she does, and that if, I, if she said, no, 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 let's not do that, we'd end up buying something like it anyway. She said, no, 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 we'll just, we'll just, just you may as well get it. You won't be happy with any less. So now I have this. <laughs> so that's 10 inch uh, aperture, that's the size of the opening on it. It's like a light bucket, and the bigger the opening, the more light it catches. The wedge is the full um, commercial wedge, and um, it's got a GPS on it, and it's all very fancy and fun. So I now went out one night and I got that shot, so that's the core of the Orion Nebula. Again, it's all just nebulas and clouds of gas. And that one's about two minutes, I think, and it's a single photograph, and it's that particular nebula is the brightest in the, um, in, in, in the sky. So, uh, and you see the dust cloud in the centre, and there's dust all through the edges. So I was very pleased to have had something like that. But I can't stop. <laughs> now that's a that's a shot of the moon in the eclipse. That's actually 12 photographs because the, the bigger the telescope, like the longer the focal length, so you've got the size of the aperture and then you've got the length of the fo uh, of The focal length gives you the amount of magnification. But as you magnify more, the amount you can see is small. So if you've looked at your camera and you zoom, you see when you do the zoom, you get closer into the subject, but the amount you can see is less. So um, this particular telescope has got a two and a half metre focal length. So if you used a conventional Newtonian telescope, the ones that people, or a refracting telescope with the lenses that most people are familiar with, or your standard camera lens, it'd be two and a half metres long. This one's a uh, schmidt cassegrain grain telescope that folds the light backwards and forwards and there's a bit of fancy optics in there, which means you get a two and a half metre focal length out of something about that long. And so I took 12 photos of the moon, or portions of the moon, and then stitched them all together to get that shot of the moon in eclipse. And that's a shot of um, the Eta Carina Nebula. That's, again, just a single photograph, about two minutes. But we're starting to see some information in there, a bit more detail. But by now, I'm realising that I need better tracking than I've got. And uh, so to do that, you need a second telescope on your main telescope and a second camera on the second telescope. And then underneath that towel, 
is a computer, and this computer cable is connected back to the telescope. So you take photographs, one second exposure length, typically, with the small camera on that Newtonian telescope, and there you've got an example. That small telescope on there that's longer than the main tube is only about 900 millimetre focal length, and the one behind it, the short, is two and a half metres. So the different type of telescope makes a difference to the overall length. So that is calibrated on a star. So you have a bit of software running on the computer, and it takes a photo of the star, and then it analyzes it. And if it's moved from the previous photo, and the star's moved, it sends commands back out to the telescope to adjust it. So the telescope's already tracking the sky, but every couple of seconds it's getting corrections. So that it follows, this, it's locked on, it's auto-guiding, it's called on the, on the sky. It is. Yes, that was one of the joys of it, and it fits in a box that I had to buy a station wagon because it wouldn't fit in a car. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. Uh, I think we need a new car. <laughs> Why? Uh, it doesn't quite fit. And again, you say how long suffering my wife is. I, could, by myself, can't lift it onto the mount by myself. So two o'clock in the morning, Caroline, can you come out and help me put the telescope in the box? Um, so yeah, thank you, Caroline. So yes, it's, it's not a light lift, and and also I don't want to drop it. So I, I'd go to some effort to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> that's all right. I'm, I'm happy for anyone to ask questions. It's absolutely fine. But here we can see now, there's the Trifid Nebula again. But that's an earlier photo of the Trifid Nebula before some of the stuff I'm doing now. And that's the Eagle Nebula down on the right. And you see that now I'm starting to get stars and more pinpoint. And I'm starting to image targets that are more difficult to get. You know, it's, okay, now I can do that one, but that's too easy. The moon's boring. How about we get something a little bit dimmer? So, um, if you if you try and remember that that one on the right is the, the Trifid Nebula, I mean the uh, Eagle Nebula, and the one on the left is the Trifid Nebula, you'll see them repeating, and you'll see that I've progressed over time with, with what I'm doing. So, all these next step, next steps are to achieve a result. But those now are starting to be more than one photograph. You take more than one photograph, and then there's software. I started out with a program called Deep Sky Stack, it's kind of a magic box. And you tell it these are all the photographs, and it lines them all up. So all the stars match on top of each other. And if you imagine, if you wanted to measure this, the distance from here to here, to here accurately, but you only had a uh, measuring tape, and you want it better than half a millimetre. If you measure it once, you go, okay, well, it's, you know, what are we we're talking about 500 millimetres-ish. Measure it twice, now you get 502. You measure it three times, you get 498. You measure it five times, and you do it over and over and over again. And by the time you do that, if you do it 20 times and then you average it, you're going to get closer to the real number than if you just do it once. And the more times you do it, the closer you're going to get. But it's not a simple, if I do twice as many, I get twice as good results. It actually tapers off. So you get a big improvement by doing it a few times, but then you have to make more and more and more to make smaller and smaller improvements. So with this, you take the photograph more than once, and then the software actually does an averaging on every pixel, every dot in that photograph, and it gets it closer and closer to the real number, so that you're getting a better and better photograph. So it's, it's called stacking. So if I talk about stacking, I'm saying I'm taking multiple photographs and then the software actually does maths and averages every single dot to get less and less noise. I imagine that it also would depend on what field you're in. You know, in, in astrophotography, we talk about it. <laughs> if there's any noises coming from this light, I'm sure that I'm always right. <laughs> so, that's, now we're back at the Orion Nebula but I've got a focal reducer now that makes me uh, able to take a slightly bigger photograph. And uh, we can see that we're getting more detail in the size. I'm not, still not 100% happy with the colour in that, but it's, it's an okay photo, I guess. But um, it's taking about four and a half hours to set up. So you, you look at it and think, oh, it looks like it might good, be a good night tonight. 
So you go out there and you start setting up and finally you lift the thing up and you start to do the alignment with the sky and then the clouds come in and you go, I'm not going to put it away by clear. And then at midnight you go, Caroline, can you help me put this away? <laughs> and it gets very frustrating. I drove down, Dad has uh, 80 acres of uh, land out at Yerion and he's got a nice clearing and I've twice driven down there and spent hours sitting up and it's clouded out. And I stayed out there, I got up every 40 minutes through the whole night and it never cleared. So it can be very frustrating. So the obvious thing to do is to build an observatory. <laughs> <laughs> so I, as Betty Finn and Turner, I went to a, the company I'd worked at before I was at the university and I scored myself a 1.8 metre length of RHS, nice centimetre wall thickness, nice post to put my telescope on, put some um, bolts in it in it. So when it poured into concrete, it all locks in nicely. And that's my cousin and actually the guy on the, in the red, my cousin, and the, the guy on the right is the colleague that's a uh, physicist. Um, so I got them to help me dig the hole. And then you see Dad looking very erudite there in his nice hat with uh, some of his timber from his block. And uh, that's the thickness that we put it through. And there's the frames. And so this is the backyard. And that's actually more or less where I was setting up the telescope before. Um, so it built up the frame. And uh, you'll notice there's a frame around the post. So that when you walk on the floor, it doesn't actually touch the post, so you can move around and it doesn't bounce your telescope around. Clamp up the floor, put some, not fibro, whatever it's called now, up on the walls. And, ta-da, you have an observatory. So the roof rolls open. Um, I've just, over the last Christmas holidays, completely redesigned the roll off of the roof. Um, but that was what I could build at the time. And so there's the telescope. So now, uh, well, and don't think Caroline didn't win. That's a new clothesline, I'll have you know. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be in a place that was in the road. Okay, you can get a new clothes. So everybody wins. So um, I said I'd build a small observatory, and when it was built, she went, that's not small. <laughs> it's small, it could have been bigger. So. Now, it means that I can just go out, roll the roof open, turn on the gear, and I don't have to go through four and a half hours of setup. So it looks good, it looks good, it looks bad. Okay. It does get frustrating when it's bad for a long time, but it means that if you've got an opportunity, you can take it. And, of course, I ran in it down there, and uh, I've got a little infrared camera that doesn't affect my measurements. So I sit in the lounge room with the notebook computer, and I watch everything working. If I need to go down there in the mosquitoes or the cold, I, I, I do. But more or less, I start it up and then I just go and sit in my lounge room and wait for it to get time to go to bed or wait for the clouds to come or whatever. And I can open up in about 20 minutes, although I've, my new camera takes about an hour to cool down. I measure it at minus 15 degrees. But um, it, it's just enormously better than what it was before. Um, so you can see there's the wedge on the, uh, I've made up a wooden sample, oh, you can see the box behind it, that uh, that was the box that that telescope always travelled in, now that box doesn't get used very much. And then when I was, when I proved that it all worked with that timber set up, I got made up out of, out of aluminium. And then, uh, of course, you need another telescope so that one is a 600 millimeter. The one on the top is a 600 millimeter telescope, and the camera is on that. And with that, you can take a much wider, just the numbers. It's about two degrees of the sky you can see with 600 mil, and it's down around 0 0.4, 0 0.3 degrees of the sky you see with the big one. So it means that there's some targets you want to take a photo of, and they just won't fit in the big one. So you want the small one and others are small and you want the big one. So you've got this option, so that's nice. And um, I 
guide the big telescope to the small one when I'm doing the guiding, but for reasons I won't go into, I actually have a second little guide scope that goes on the small one, and the, the big blue one just becomes a lump to sit the other one on uh, when I'm doing that. Uh, no, well, I've just got a little guide scope, and uh, if you're interested, I'll talk to you after about dithering. But uh, I mean, dithering is not what it sounds, it's actually a really sophisticated technique. I think my wife might think I'm out there dithering a lot, but um, <laughs> um, it works better with a smaller 150 millimeter to guide the 600, and the 600 guides the 2.4, 2.5 well. And you can see that, that we've got the guide camera on the big telescope and the digital SLR on the back of the small telescope. Just keeping on. So. This was my first go at the Horsehead Nebula. Now, it's, it's, this one's using the uh, smaller telescope. It's quite a wide angle. And the, the one in the centre is next to the bright star there. It's is called the Flame Nebula. And if you go directly up from Flame Nebula, there's a star with a bit of nebula diffuse for it. And just up and to the left, there's a little black sort of a lump that looks a bit like a horsehead, and that's the Horsehead Nebula. Um, but you can see that there's actually a lot of graininess in that photograph and there's sort of lines going sideways across it and you don't really bring out that detail. It's, it's quite faint, so obviously you need to buy some more things. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, Southern uh, Pinball Galaxy, again taken with the uh, small telescope. Um, and um, that's starting to get somewhere. The galaxies are always nasty. They're, they're not very bright. Oh, Andromeda is pretty bright, but mostly they tend to be nasty things to photograph. Um, this is taken with a big telescope, and it's the sun that blew up so up. It didn't do a very good job, that little blue spot. It's, uh, they call it planetary nebula, but they're actually a failed star, like a, a star uh, blows up and doesn't really diffuse and so you get you get the remaining hydrogen. And this one we've got a, it's again I'm less happy with these ones, but that line, that sort of a tick shape going through there, is all dust. And there's blue nebula, reflection nebula all through around the section, a little globular cluster, star cluster down in the bottom there. That one's shot with the Small telescope too, I think. And here's our Triffid Nebula, trusty again, but you can see the difference. That one's shot with the 600 millimeter telescope, not the two and a half meter telescope. But just on this one, note particularly that it looks, behind it looks more or less black in this shot. And so again, you can see there's the blue of the reflection and the red of the emission. I'm quite happy with the star color in that one. but it turns out that photo, uh, cameras that are made to take photos outside in bright light or photos in a room like this with a flash are not set up to do this type of photography. They're designed to take a really fast photograph and if you imagine that you've got a bucket that you want to fill, it's like uh, if you're in this room, it's raining really hard and it fills up really quick. But if you're pointing at a point at the sky where if you look at it with your naked eye, you don't see anything, it's just black. It's like it's got the faintest mist and you're waiting for this thing to fill up. So instead of shooting for uh, a 200th of a second, you're now shooting for 15 minutes and the camera starts getting hot. And as the camera gets hot, it actually heats up the sensor and the sensor is sensitive to infrared light as well as visible. And so it turns on pixels and get all these red dots and green dots and blue dots all through your photograph and so you get this glow that you don't want. So uh, also the most of the light that comes off hydrogen, the emission uh, from hydrogen is the hydrogen alpha emission line. It's the first emission and it's just below where we can see. It's not far below the visible but it is in into the infrared and because cameras for normal use are made to take a photo and show it as we see it, it only shows what's in the visible spectrum. So if you take the camera apart and remove a filter they're put in, you can actually see down into the infrared. And so I've had my camera modified and uh, 
you also uh, can get a light pollution filter that blocks out the light in that sort of orange yellow region that you get from the street lights and if you don't have that in the sky glows red in about two to three minutes whereas with the light pollution filter you can get it right out i take typically about 15 minutes so here's an example of what it takes and if i use any jargon or you've got any questions don't hesitate i, I gave this talk a while back uh, or similar and uh, uh, someone commented that it got a bit technical so don't hesitate if, if it's boring and, and you'd rather sleep and that's okay too but i won't take won't take too long about it you just going back to that uh, last photograph of nebula uh, yes if you were to take that in a year or two's time would it still have the same pattern yes yes this stuff <clears throat> was very large and to see the actual changes in it you'd have to be a lot closer even with hubble and those guys they can't determine any and you're seeing, uh, uh, in, you know, you're seeing the past is one of the interesting things. You're seeing what that looked like 16,000 years ago because it's taken that long for the light to get to us. But um, all of these things are far enough away um, that, uh, and, and large enough that to our measurements, there are supernovas go and things like that, but broadly speaking, it doesn't. It, you can, there's changes that they've detected from, actually from astrology, very very rigorous measurements for astro uh, the major astrologers they can see that there's been shifts in some of the constellations over thousands of years um, they did have accurate enough they do have accurate enough records from the astrologers but it's very slow we don't we don't see it from year to year planets are different what sort of difference are you talking about uh, as i said i think that's sixteen thousand light years away that one but we're often out at you know hundreds of thousands of light years uh, millions of light years if you're talking galaxies they're millions of light years away hundreds of millions of light years away so we, they're a long way away uh, okay there's there's shift so red shift and blue shift you know that as a car drives past compresses the waves as it's coming towards you and then they expand as they go away and the color shifts and so they can actually classify the star with spectroscopy and then they can look at a shift red shift or blue shift and that shift's going further away coming towards you and through that sort of stuff and a, and a lot of extrapolation mathematics they can then determine the distance i mean we can't get over here and here and measure the difference because uh, it's so far away but it's the red shift and blue shift so here's a little exercise just to demonstrate one of the most critical points on what i do so if you guys can all just think of the last movie you saw and uh did you enjoy it and uh, the last book you read and you enjoyed it? Just have a little chat amongst yourself about that. If we assume in this case that I am the signal, the signal is what you want. Well, that might be debatable for some of you, but in this case, I will be the signal. And anything that's not me, anything that makes it harder to hear me, is the noise. So when I walked away from the microphone and kept talking, the signal went down because the amplifying effect of the microphone and amplifiers went. So the signal dropped and the noise came up. And it got to a point where if I had continued to talk and you guys were indifferent enough and you know, uncultured enough that you just kept talking, and I'm sure you've all been in meetings like that, you can't hear the signal. There's nothing. And it's the same, we're getting a amount of signal off, off the sky, the light from the sky, but there's all this noise, it's electronics, it's uh, atmosphere, it's, you know, there's all these things that we don't want. And we have a ratio between what the signal, what we want, and the noise. And when you take a normal photograph, like we have about to happen in here, if you can work out how to push the buttons, there's, there's, a, um, there's a lot of signal, because all, the signal is light. There's a lot of it. And uh, there's, there's a certain amount of noise in the camera, but the ratio between the two is really good. But if you point that at something that's so <coughs> dim that you just really can't see it that the signal drops right down here so the ratio between that signal and that noise gets a lot worse there's a whole lot of more noise in ratio to the signal so the first thing we have to do is open for longer to get more signal it just builds up but as we do that there's also electronic problems and optical problems that begin to expose or reveal themselves so you probably can't see real well that just looks like a black shot but if you zoom in on it, can you see there's little dots all over that shot? 
those are all pixels. So a pixel is just a sensor that the light hits and it puts an electric charge in it. They are pixels that have turned on. That shot is taken with the lens cap on. So if the camera was perfect, it would just be black. But pixels have turned on because of the heat. And it's, it's called um, hot noise. Or, so that's, um, that's, your, that's called a dark flow. And there's actually red, green and blue. I won't go into specifics of why, but if anyone's interested, I can tell you later. So if you take a set of photos like this and you average them, and then you subtract them from each of the photos you took of the target, if you subtract red from red, you get black. If you subtract green from green, you get black. Blue from blue, you get black. So it actually subtracts out that hot noise. And so that's the first, that's the first game we play. This frame also probably looks fairly black and nothing. But if you zoom in on it, you can see that there's all those lines. Now the spots are the thermal noise, because it's got that as well. But the lines are a product of reading the sensor. There's an electronic device, it's got noise in it. And when you read that, no read that sensor, you also get the noise. And the ratio of those two um, noise components against the signal in an astron astronomical photo is terrible. So it really makes your photos look awful. Now this is a photo taken straight from the camera, but it's got a white sheet over the end of the camera, uh, over the end of the telescope. And it's pointed away from the sun, and it's just a normal exposed photo. And if it was perfect, it wouldn't have those dark corners. You see it's bright in the middle and dark on the corners? And that is called vignetting, and it's a product of the optics. So. If you take a really bright photograph, you just don't notice. When you're taking a really, really faint photograph, you do notice that it's dark in the corners. You might notice also there's a little splodge in sort of up middle, two thirds of the way up, and one down at the bottom. They're just little bits of dust on the sensor. They're called dust bunnies, and so they get they get stuck in your photograph as well. So you take these, and through a really convoluted process. You, it takes me, depending on the photograph, it might take me three to four or five hours to actually go through and actually do the subtraction. It's software that does it. But you use these frames that actually, they, they quantify, they tell me, this is what the noise is. This is your bias noise. This is your dark noise, you know, the, the uh, pixelation. And this is your vignetting. And it mathematically extracts them out. So you end up with a much better signal noise ratio and then once you've done all that, you then stack all your photographs and you get better noise again. And now what you can do is you can lift up really faint information. Uh, um, I won't go into it, but again, if people are interested, basically it's called stretching and you, you reveal what's there. Now, if you, don't, if you just take a single frame and you stretch it to bring up this really faint detail, it just looks horrible because of all that noise. But if you do all this processing, you can lift it up and reveal what's actually there. So it's scientifically valid. You're not making it up, but it's uh, it's not there when you just take one photograph. So here's here's a shot of the Eta Corona Nebula, and that's as it comes straight out of the camera with about I think that might be ten minutes or something like that. And that's so stacked. I've taken a lot of them and I've just average them. And if you started bringing that up, you'd see it would be a bit better. There's a little bit of processing just to tidy it up. Now this is a processed image and it doesn't have the flats in it. And that's the same with the flats. So you can see that that makes quite a bit of detail. It brings out more information. And then Finally, we go into Photoshop and we pull up detail, pull up colour, and we balance it so that we get the right colour. Uh, people possibly be going, is it what it really looks like? If we could see it, then more or less, yes, it is. It's just that it's so faint that our eyes aren't able to see that. But the colours are real. But, of course, now we're starting to get into, we've got longer exposures, 
And the, because I'm opening the camera, for 15 minutes at a time, I do it for six hours straight, eight hours straight, the, the thing's really starting to have a bit of problems. So the obvious thing to do is build a fridge for your camera. <laughs> so that shiny silver thing, it's, you know, you buy a little camp fridge and you just plug them into your cigarette lighter and they, they cool? Well, that uses a thing called a Peltier Element. It's an electrical cooler. It's hot on one side, cold on the other. So I downloaded some uh, instructions from the internet and that's Mark 1 camera cooler. <laughs> and that got the camera down. If you just run the camera on a normal night that's 20 degrees outside, the camera sensor would get up to about 35 degrees, 36 degrees. That got it down to about 12. Now, for every 6 degrees you cool the camera, you halve the amount of thermal noise. So that's making quite a big difference. Since then, I completely redesigned that and built something up, and I was getting the camera down to close to zero. But of course, when you get it close to zero, you're worried about ice forming, you're worried about water forming in the camera while you're doing it. So I got a dehumidifier that just <laughs> built it. So you cool, the, you cool air down to about minus five degrees, pump it through with a little fish tank pump I was, and then you pump that in around the camera so that that air, as you cool it, that moisture comes out and then it condenses on your glass as you... Uh, so that condenses out the water. So I'd spend about an hour letting everything, uh, the, the, the humidifier cold, get cold, get the, the dry air around it, and then turn on the camera cooler. I wrote a bit of software that would log it and build a little microcomputer based temperature logger so I could plot and watch six temperature channels. And as it all came down, and then now everything settled, and I'd get it down to close to zero. And, uh, and then the camera, I was getting about 50 times less noise in the camera than when I didn't have the cooler. So here's an example of progress over time. This is my first attempt to get the Rosette Nebula, and it's down off centre to the left at the bottom. It's that sort of bluey thing. And that um, was taken with, uh, I think that was just taken with the camera lens, with it piggybacked, the camera not cool and the camera not modified so that there was, um, the filter was blocking. That's the first shot with my new 600mm telescope. Again, no cooling of the camera and it's, it's reasonably faint and so you have to work harder to get it. You can see there's the lines that are going through it and the colour is not great is now with the light pollution filter and no camera cooler. And that is with the camera cooled down to 12 degrees. So you can see that all that red down the right hand side is actually just the sensor getting hot. You cool the sensor down and bam, there's your target. So now these are some of my more modern and more recent images. So I've got the auto guiding working really well. I modified the camera, I've got a new light pollution filter, cooled the camera. Now do a lot more manual work with stacking and processing images. And I've just recently bought a new dedicated, built for astronomy camera that actually got coolant built into it and it will cool down to 38 degrees below the ambient temperature. And that actually makes a lot of difference, not just with the thermal noise, it makes it more sensitive as well. So this is shot with the 600mm and you can see there's a lot more red coming through because of the modified camera. That's the Swan Nebula or oh, there's about five different names for that nebula. There's the Eagle Nebula. Now if you remember I said earlier, a lot earlier, that that was the Eagle Nebula. This is a more recent shot and you can see all this red, there's actually glowing foraging. All this right near this, this is in the Milky Way and all the black is just dust. It's not actually black sky, it's actually dust obscuring what's behind it. And there's the Triffid Nebula again, but again you can see here there's the, the corner of the lagoon, the lagoon Nebula over there, but you can see again that there's all this glowing hydrogen up there, so many more stars than I was getting before, and there's dust flames coming through. Here's Eagle Nebula through the big telescope. 
and uh, actually there's a very, very famous hover wedge called the Pearls of Creation, and that's those sort of the detail right in the middle. But again, you can see that it's all dust all around the outside that's obscuring it, and it, so there's hydrogen right through that region, and where you see black, it's just obscured by dust, because the distance away that is, if you if you look at if I'm standing here and you, what's your name, sir? Sid. If Sid's there, we look, we get two different views. But if you're a mile away, the angle is so similar that we can't tell the difference. It's just that angular distance. So the Earth is relatively so small that given the distances away, we may as well be looking from the same place. And that's another planetary nebula. That's the Helix Nebula. And you can see that the blue's in the middle and there's a sort of second wave. So it's exploded and, uh, and not really completely destroyed itself. Um, of course, I look at that and I see the little stretched stars up in the top corner and over there and start thinking, how can I improve on that? But it's still, it's getting somewhere. And if you remember the horse head I pointed out before, now with the cool camera, with the, that's actually shot with my new um, dedicated astronomy camera. The flame nebula down there, you can see all that detail that's come up. So that's the difference that all of that craziness that I get into, it actually makes a real difference. But you don't have to go crazy like me. A couple of weeks ago, I had to go down to uh, a place called Cape Grim, fantastic place to holiday, um, in Tasmania. It's at the northwest tip of Tasmania. And it's one of the cleanest air sites in the world. And it gets air that's spent thousands and thousands of kilometres out over the southern ocean and it sweeps up around over. And they've got, they're making um, clean air measurements, they've been doing that for 30 years. And I got bagged out by my colleague for taking my camera. Why do you need all that crap? It was only my camera and a tripod. And I realised that I actually had a little, I always have it in my pocket. There's my USB cable. You never know when you need it. And um, uh, as I was saying before, you never know when you need things, so there's my Leatherman, just in case. Um, it was handy because that mic wasn't quite right. So, um, so I went out and I stopped around, it was dark. Like the nearest town, which is not a town, it was small, Milton, is uh, about 40 minutes drive away. And it's not, it's not big. And so this, it was really black. And there were sea mist coming and going, and I was stomping around in this tussock grass with a tripod and a camera and a stool, plug my camera to the computer. So there's the Southern Cross, and that's the top of a communications tower that's at that site. And that is a single shot. Uh, I think it's about two minutes. If you go more than that, uh, that's shot with 50 millimeter fixed lip focal length uh, lens. If you shoot for longer than that, you start getting sky movement that trails around. And you can't stack because I've got something that's not moving in there. So if you did try to stack, either the tower would be furry or the sky would be furry. So, but that's just a single shot. So if people have got, hey, Mike, with that camera we have Is sitting down the there. Way across there. What's that? Is that the Milky yes, that's the Milky Way coming right through there. And the Eta Carina Nebula that I've shown several shots of um, is just down on the right hand side toward the bottom, that bit of a cluster in there. That's that's the Eta Carina Nebula. Uh, which is actually the nebula I gave the example of working up the photos on. Uh, that set of work up, that's that little patch down there. So the total amount of the sky that I can see with my big telescope is just <laughs> that little chunk of bright stars down there. But you can do a lot of stuff, and it's not a bad little photo of the Milky Way. And, and with a tripod, it is much better if you use a camera and you plug the camera in and there's, if you go to Canon, there's um, um, Canon, the, the EOS utility, and it'll let you operate the camera from the computer. So it means you get a live view of it on your big screen and you can adjust the focus. It's really hard to get focus if you're just looking through the camera or looking at the screen on the camera. So that is an example of what you can do with what a lot of people already have sitting in their cupboard at home. So that's about it for me, and I've used up all the time. We have a question. 
I mean, it's amazing what you can do, and, and people did stuff before. I mean, we're lucky now. Computers allow you to do all sorts of things that were just impossible. Some of these photos that are here, 60, 70 years ago, the biggest telescopes in the world weren't taking photos any better than that because they just had to use film and they had to deal with a lot of other problems. Whereas with computers, we, we can cheat. <laughs> we can do it a lot cheaper. 